When Sambala heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring these stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they're building, even if a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. And this is how it reads a bit like a, a journal. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of ta- captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all of their heart. But when Sambala, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and he posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. It seems almost like an impossible situation, doesn't it? Now last week, we examined the need that Nehemiah and the returning exiles had for identity. And we talked a lot about identity and the need for that. The need to know that they were still God's children, despite the fact that Jerusalem didn't live up to the expectations of the stories that they've been told and the memories that have been passed on to them. And there's hope beyond the rubble. You remember that? We talked about that. He was trying to get them to see beyond it. God has selected a man for a season. He's t- he selected this man to take charge of the difficulty, but interestingly enough, he has chosen someone who's not a free man. It's interesting, God always chooses the weak and foolish things of this world, doesn't he? He chose a man who was in captivity, in service, one who was in a position where there was little chance of release. And if he, he was free to be away from his duties for a while. But you know something? Nehemiah had to go back. Have you ever thought about that? The fact was, he'd been released to do this job. He's suddenly living the dream that he's always had. And actually, beyond the dream that he ever had, he's got all this stuff, but he knows in the back of his mind that he's got to go back. He's got to return to the exile that his people had longed to be out of all those years ago. See, this is an incredible journey of faith, this. It's not just for the people of Israel, but also for Nehemiah. But, and here we have the perspective, listen to this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares declares the Lord. God has got a plan. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, Nehemiah as a pilgrim, prompted by the Holy Spirit, felt in his heart the emptiness of no hope. And he despaired for his people because he understood from his education as a young youngster, although he'd actually never been to Jerusalem, he understood the importance of the place as the promised land provided by God and as the centre of worship for his people. So it had to be a place of focus. He understood that's where identity was. And he wanted them to understand that in a very natural way. Now, what I mean by this is that for generations, in a a subtle but direct way, this underlying importance of their heritage and history was stressed to them. They had been passed on generation after generation how important it was that they were people. And you remember, the folk had been taken into exile, people had been separated up, there was no chance of regrouping. You remember that I said at week one, how everyone came back together, folk from different parts of the kingdom, folk looking like... Babylonians and Persians and all different kinds of people often speak in different dialects but what they had in common was their identity as the people of God and it was almost it's almost like a, a family tradition you know when you know when you get together as an extended family at Christmas 
you know, there's going to be the inevitable arguments later on. But it starts off really nice, doesn't it? And everyone sits around the dinner table and you start reflecting on the past year and everyone's having a bit of a laugh and everything. And then inevitably, exactly what happens in our house, the old stories come out. And all those things that you thought are gone, they suddenly resurface again. Do you know? And one of the favourites in my, my parents' house was the year when my cousin and I, and I don't remember much about this, and it may have been the result of what I did, but my cousin and I found my uncle's home brew. And we didn't know it was home brew, and we drank several bottles, and uh, we slept very well for a few days. But, you know, now... We didn't go out to get drunk, but we were a couple of kids and we found these bottles of what we thought was nice plonk and we, we drank it. And I'm reminded of that even today. You know, in life sometimes, there's dark times. This place for Jerusalem, for Nehemiah, was actually potentially a really dark time, you know. Remember last week we said he arrived and he's got all these expectations and he's riding along with a cavalry officer and he's talking about all these great things and how the king had spoken to him and had been released. And he says, oh, we're coming up to Jerusalem now. And he looks in the distance and he cannot believe that it's in a state that it's in. But there's ways of coping with that, isn't there? And this is exactly where God meets us in the dark times. Times when we feel that life is hopeless, there is no hope. You've got all those resources around you and suddenly everything is meaningless because realize, you realise there is no hope beyond. You know, in the, during the 30 years war in the 17th century, the German pastor Paul Gerhard and his family had been forced out of their home and they were running for their lives. They ended up in an inn and his wife came to an end of it and she just wept. And in the only way that he knew how, and as a 17th century gentleman, he sat down with the scriptures with her and he tried to explain to her the promises of God. He tried to encourage her in her soul, but she was beyond. Anyway, he went out in the garden and he collapsed and cried because he was at an end of himself as well. And as he was crying out to God, God gave him some words for him. And listen to these words. Give to the winds thy fears, hope and be undismayed. God hears thy sighs and counts thy tears. God shall lift up thy head through waves and clouds and storms. He gently clears the way. Wait thou his time. So shall the night soon end in glorious day. You know, it's in these darkest times that God reveals something of his light and you get a glimpse that is beyond you and you realise that actually everything is in perspective and he is in control. And this is exactly where Nehemiah was. He needed a song to sing. You know, we read Psalm 40 the other week, didn't we? He drew me from a fearful pit, sat with me, up from the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock, establishing my way. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. That's exactly what Nehemiah wanted. Exactly what every believer needs. A song in their heart to sing to God. And he needed another encounter with God that would give him the assurance he needed so that the ache that he was experienced could be just eased. And we know that the Lord answered his prayers and when he finally arrived in Jerusalem he was able to physically see this devastation that, that comes from disobedience, by the way. But this was no guilt trip he was on. He was a man on a mission. And he could see hope beyond the rubble. You know, I was thinking as I was reading that this morning, I actually wrote a footnote. It was said of Michelangelo. One time he walked into his workshop and there was a piece of marble standing there and he looked at it and he went, there's an angel in there. Because he never thought he created anything. He thought he just chipped off the stone and it came out. What a way to see things. You see, he saw through the rough and the ugly exterior. And he said, he, instead he saw the beauty beyond that. And Nehemiah knew that it, if there was to be any development or any change in of heart, then actually it had to start with him. And so the journey of faith of the rebuilding, it all gets underway with the unlikeliest people fulfilling the plan of God. And you know, I was reminded of C.S. Lewis. He says, God seems to do nothing of himself which he can possibly delegate to his creatures. And this is lovely. He commands us to slowly and blundering, blundering, blunderingly do, I'll get it out in a minute, 
what he could do perfectly in the twinkling of an eye. God doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. He chooses to bless us. He chooses to reveal his reality to us so that we can be of use to our world, so that others can know him too. You see, our God, our God is a God of the impossible. And this has been the fact that has warmed the hearts of God's people as far back as history goes. For example, remember back in Genesis when the Lord came to visit Abraham and Sarah in their old age? And they were promised a child and Sarah laughed. That's impossible. But God had promised. And he proved he was faithful and reliable and true as his word. And in the text, what we see has happened here, when Nehemiah has gone around and he's actually suddenly told the people what God had done. They cracked on with the work. And then we get to Nehemiah chapter 4. And we see those who are critical of the Jews' ability to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And this was an impossible task. And yet, they could see that they were enthused under leadership of Nehemiah. It was really unsettling for them. Look at verses 1 to 3. It said, When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. Now, stop there just for a second. Just think about the beginning when we read that. Nehemiah actually said to him, Well, that. God is going to give us success. He didn't wave the scroll in front of him and say the king had given him permission. That's all he had had to do. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? See all the threats there because he's worried about they're going to become a great nation again and suddenly they're going to come to know their God and they're going to be a, a, they're going to be a, a force to be reckoned with. Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? And then Tobiah, he's a funny one, isn't he? He's the Ammonite who was at his side and said, oh, what they're building, even if a fox climbed on the walls, it knocked the stones down. No, 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 no. <laughs> now, we agreed last time that God had a multifaceted purpose for Nehemiah. But primarily, his focus was to put God back on the agenda. It was to give these folks back a sense of identity and purpose. And clearly, God has been at work in Nehemiah's heart to bring about a national revival. And Nehemiah understood that Israel was totally dependent upon the gracious hand of his God for success. And he recognized that in order to fulfill God's purpose, he would be, have to be willing to play his part. And he understood that his faith had to be seen that was something as practically, intensely practical as well as spiritual. And this was the only way as God's people, they would be able to bring back this pile of rubble back to life. You know, it was the evangelist Gypsy Smith who responded to a question. Someone said to him, how do we start a revival? He said, well, I'll tell you what to do. Go home, go into a room and kneel on the floor and then draw a chalk, chalk line around yourself. Then ask God to start the revival inside the chalk circle. He said, and when that starts happening, the revival's on. You know, if we were to reflect back Go back in the Old Testament. We see the familiar story of God's people faced with incredible odds against them. And then approaching the battle in faith and how God gave the victory so many times. And the reason we've got this is it meant to encourage us. It's meant to help us to stand in our faith and stand for the cause of righteousness. You see, it's when we exercise faith and step out that we begin to realise that faith and hope are not elusive qualities that belong to someone else or are experienced by chance but they are the characteristic and the demonstration of who we are in Jesus Christ see the beauty of the scriptures coming to life seeing the experience of others and it builds us to the point of seeing beyond the rubble and enables us to see God interacting with ordinary folk who were afraid but were willing to trust him Go back in history again. Think of David and Goliath. You know, we talked about David as a great hero, and he was. But God, oh, he was scared. Think of Israel and Jericho. It's impossible, Lord. 
And then coming to the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, and we see the Hebrews believers being reminded of all of that heritage. And you and I are part of that, by the way. This is our heritage. We're being reminded of it. But now we've received the promise we can start beginning to appreciate with the hindsight that history brings that faith is the essential quality of discipleship and without it we cannot know God. Faith is what? Being sure of what we hope for. Being certain of what we do not see. And as we watch the progress of the walls being built, we begin to realise that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Absolutely nothing. We got some fantastic friends who were missionaries in Afghanistan. And you know, to listen to them talk sometimes, some folk would just say they were so simplistic. But oh, the faith. And sometimes you just, you just soak it up. Because for them, nothing is impossible. And because we have confidence in that, he can resurrect us from the rubble that our lives are in. Now there's some important lessons and we're going to look at one this morning. As we observe Nehemiah's efforts, we, learn to, we realise it illustrates for us that obstructions in our life, in our life of faith actually, are inevitable. If we're in the will of God, you know, it's okay for us to say that we're on the Lord's side. It's okay for us to enjoy his blessing. But we've got to be realistically enough to accept that the spiritual battle will be fearsome as we deal with all this rubble and clutter in our lives and in the life of the church. And that's where the building begins, you know. Mm -hmm. How many times have you gone into your children's bedrooms to do some tidying up? <coughs> what do you do first? You walk through and you pick up all the dirty washing, don't you? All right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> then, then, then you go and you make the bed. Okay, so you've got something neat. So you say, right, now I've got a bit of space. Then, then you start working on the shoes. And then you, and you go around and you start doing stuff. I have to do it in our bedroom all the time because Mary's terrible. <laughs> I've got a hard life. You can see that, can't you? We have to deal with this. And this is going to something we're going to have to deal with in our own community. And this is the reality of the community that we in the West actually often just dabble with a bit. The community is to be the place where we can deal with issues, where we can deal with personal conflict, where we can establish boundaries and grow the example that God intends for us to grow. See, no one ever said that it was going to be a walk in the park. And that's why in love we have to be accountable to the Lord and we have to be accountable to each other, moving beyond personal interest. And that's often where we fail, because we say, if I don't like it, I won't do it. That's not my bag. I, I can remember in my church, and I was asked to organise all sorts of events. And I said, OK, we'll organise something. And I asked for suggestions, and one chap said, tell you what we do. I'm a member of a choir. He said, and we'd love to come to the town and do something. I said, brilliant idea. Now, all the people have been enthusing, enthusing about doing something... I went to the next meeting and I said, guess what, we're going to do something. And they said, what are you going to do? I said, well, told them the chap's name, he's going to bring a choir and we're going to have a ticket. And he went, oh, don't fancy that. Why? Oh, well, it's not my thing. What do you mean it's not your thing? The fact is, it's for the benefit of others. It's about us being together. And sometimes we have to do things that we don't like doing. I mean, I have to be honest. Watching a game of soccer, to me, is like watching paint dry, okay? But if it meant that we could show a cup, a cup match in here and serve so, so pie and bovril at half-time, if we can get 100 people in here, I'd do it. I'd watch the paint dry for an hour. I don't care. See, we have to come to the point in our study, we've come to the point in our study where Nehemiah has been given permission from the king to return to Jerusalem. He's done a survey of the ruins, and he's confident in his calling, He's beginning to grow in faith and in his enthusiasm, he's encouraged these people to join him in rebuilding. And as the numbers of helpers increased, he comes upon that age-old problem in the church. There's plenty there who wanted a blessing, but they don't want the cost. And they didn't want to get their hands dirty. And it wasn't just people in the church, it was people outside the church as well. You know, when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed. They didn't want to be a part of this. 
It doesn't matter how we go about it, you see. God is at work and there will always be opposition from both within and without. And when Satan comes to realize that we are serious about rebuilding our walls, well, I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to take the gloves off and then the fight begins. As we begin to recover the damage, as we start forgiving the hurts, as we start to deal with the ruins, the devil will do everything he can to hinder our efforts. And it's a bit like you putting a dirty washing in a basket and someone's chucking it out again all the time. Just think back. You've been here longer than I have. Just think back to all the people that used to worship here. And they left for no other reason other than their pride got in the way. I don't care about the, in, the ins and outs of it. That's not the point. In fact, it's pride. And none of us are immune to that. You know, I've, I've been in churches where the folk in the churches call themselves Christian. And they've done nothing but work to undermine the church because it doesn't salute the, suit them. Because their philosophy is, it's my way or no way. As we start to rebuild, there will be discouragement through criticism, through ridicule and rejection. And these are just Satan's tools of, of destruction. So let's see how he employs them. Look at this. Verse, verses 1. When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they, sac will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring these stones back to life from the heaps of rubble that are burned? And Tobiah the Ammonite, of course, then goes on about the foxes. You know, you can hear the tone, can't you? The sar sarcasm there in their comments. But note something else. There's this fear that accompanies it. And there's this Tobiah. It just, he's been really annoying me all week. What are they building? Even if a fox climbed up on it, he'd break down all the stones. Don't you just want to go and give him a slap, you know? There's always going to be folks like that, you know, who just dog us at our every move. Those who appear to have second-guessed everything, and they sound very authoritative as they make their opinion clear. And these are the kinds that seem to have had an easy ride in the game of life. They take out their positions, they appear to demand no personal risk, and they watch out for every mistake that we make, and it doesn't matter what you do, they come up smelling of roses, don't they? You met those people? And the incredible thing about these critics is that they really don't, it really doesn't matter, you see, whether you're successful or whether you fail, because all they'll continue to do is criticize you and oppose you every step of the way. But you, we have got to start seeing through the bravado and we've got to start smelling the fear. And it, Theodore Roosevelt, who said, it's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how strong a man, uh, how the strong man stumbled or, where, stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, who does actually try to do the deed, who knows the great enthusiasm and the great devotion and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even th though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they lived in the grey twilight that neither knows defeat or victory. So you know how to bury a good idea, don't you? We can bury good ideas by saying, well, it'll never work. Oh, we've never done it that way before. Oh, how many times about that? Oh, we're doing fine without it. Oh, can't afford that. We're not ready for it. Actually, it's not my responsibility. Look at verse 7 and 8. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed, they were really angry. They all plotted together and came to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. 
you know, it's important that we learn the difference between constructive criticism and criticism that's bent on destruction. If the criticism becomes more intense as you make progress towards your goal, then it's probably of the devil. And we can see this happening in the text, can't we? At first the critics said the fox could break down the wall. Now the gaps of the walls are beginning to be closed and decide, they decide enough is enough and they make moves to bring the people back into subjection. Ah, suddenly the light comes on, doesn't it? They like the people of God to be there and they could keep a handle on them where their moves could be predictable, where they could bully them if they wanted. But they had to be in control, you see. And this is the classic picture of the abuser and the abused. And there's nothing new under the sun. This is the mark of cowardice that bullies and critics have to live with. And it's actually, actually because they're afraid of something or someone. And so they've got sucked into this pattern of behavior that thrives on imposing misery. But when it comes to it, they're actually just afraid. Wasn't it Nikita Khrushchev when he took over as... Uh, the Premier of Soviet Union, Stalin had died and he criticised publicly Stalin's policies. And someone shouted out in the crowd at one of the rallies he was addressing, so you were one of, one of Stalin's men, so why didn't you stop him? And he said, who said that? And there was silence and he waited. And he says, now you know why. See the picture as we transpose it into our own society that laughs at the Christian church as a, as a retreat for the weak-minded. Who are forever arguing amongst themselves and who make noises about the occasional pornographic film that's being produced or point our finger at other religions because they're in error, but we never get involved in local politics. Don't feed the hungry or be that are begging at our door. Now maybe in measure there's an element of truth in what we've been said, but you see the tactic of the critic? Not concerned what we do, but interested in creating confusion and a sense of hopelessness and fear because it or they are not able to bear the thought that control is being lost. Verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is given out. And there's so much rubble that we can't build the ball. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right among them and we will kill them and put an end to their work. It's a tough thing working for God, isn't it? I used to have a little badge I used to wear, and it said on it, work for the Lord. The pay is terrible, but the fringe benefits are out of this world. <laughs> Hard work, determined work, towards a specific goal is never going to be easy. And maybe this is because we're looking forward to the end product, and that's how God sees it, doesn't he? And he's there with the journey in between. In the first instance, there's, there's been this flurry of enthusiasm. And it's the old dream again has come true, hasn't it? We're going to be a great nation and they're going to see God in charge again. It's a good dream. It's a good ambition. But in reality, these things don't happen overnight. And what we start here isn't going to happen overnight. But it's got to start, hasn't it? And secondly, they were working hard. They were putting their backs into it. And they were determined to do well. And thirdly... There was this real threat of attack. And the problem for them was that their peace of mind was being disturbed. And this was undermining their confidence. And it was this that began to spread to others, even those not involved. Ten times over these people came and they had to go. What do you have to bring this on us for? Look, we're Christians, we're, we're Christians too. You know, you're speaking for us. You talk about your own community, but it, it represents all of us, you know. Why can't you just... Go along and accept the status quo. And because of all this work, you see, it's beginning to seem insurmountable. Oh, and how are they going to cope? Because they haven't caught the vision. You see, criticism can cause us to lose our perspective. And this is what criticism is designed to do. And it's usually very effective. And all of us have experienced that kind of criticism and ridicule and mockery that's employed here. You know, when you revive your own spiritual walk... When you're determined to do it right, someone will always say to you, and maybe it's a whisper in the ear, who do you think you are anyway? Do you think you're better than anyone else? Or the voice says, well, you've made a good start. 
it's going to get harder, you know. It won't last. Maybe it's a five-minute wonder. See, the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they'll attack us. There's blind panic in the community. The problem is suddenly magnified. And suddenly the battle seems to become more intense because it dominates our thinking. And often this is the hurdle at which the church fails and the enemy knows it. Because if it can reduce our hopes for the future, our security and even our faith to a human perspective, then we'll miss the glorious plan that God has got for us. But listen to the words of George Campbell Morgan, who said, Revival cannot be organised, but we can set our sails to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. You know, and it's poetic, isn't it? It's just beautiful. But you know, sometimes we just need that kind of language to help us not to take on the romantic, but to realise that actually this glorious hope, this glorious future is of God and not of us. It's not something that we can manufacture. And we are God's people. We are strangers in this world. And real hope is there to be had. See, the enemy is not always outside the war. Often he works on those within the, in the war as well, just to d discourage us in our task. But we need to determine that we will serve the Lord shoulder to shoulder and send the message out loud and clear. Exactly what Nehemiah said in chapter 2. I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you... You've no share in the church in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. And so we continue next week. Let's keep building, shall we? Pass me another brick. Shall we just pray? We do thank you, our Father, for your love to us. We thank you that you've called us to be your children, that we are yours. That you know our name, you know the hairs upon our heads. And that you have our best interests at heart. Forgive us, we pray, the times when we allow our pride to take over. Where we allow our pride to dictate how we behave. And how so often we've missed opportunity simply because we don't think it's what we should be doing. Give us open hearts, we pray. And open minds. And give us souls that long to hear your voice. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And for his glory alone. Amen. Amen.